Hi, I'm Kevin and welcome back to my mentor. Today we'll be speaking with Lauren Lanning, um, who's an amazing artist, gaming guru, and creator of one of the most well-respected games, Oddworld. So welcome to the show, Lauren, and uh, happy to have you here. Well, it's great to be here, Kevin. Uh, I wish you well on this mission of understanding the creative process of uh, this mind. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, even just talking off camera, you're fascinating, fascinating brain. And um, I'm really curious just to start to hear more about your creative process, especially with seeing Oddworld before it was created. Mm -hmm. And so how did you actually latch onto the characters, the structure of it, and just, just talk a little bit about that? Well, it, it, it's interesting because uh, my partner, Sherry McKenna, who's worked with a, a lot of far better known names than myself throughout mm -hmm. her career, uh, creative you know, rock and roll, Mm -hmm. stars, uh, filmmakers, you know, the best in both areas. But she would always say, you solve problems differently. You just do it differently. You don't understand. And I, I would have problems communicating things. Because I always looked at it as a, a, a design problem, mm -hmm. not an inspiration of genius or, or something mm -hmm. like that, which, quite frankly, I believe very little in. Uh -huh. I, think, I think it's more hard work. And so the creative process for me is one where it starts with enormous amounts of research. It might start with a spark of inspiration, uh, but it starts with enormous amounts of research. And for me, I guess that that research really began when I was uh, just an, an infant mm -hmm. learning everything, you mm -hmm. know, how to talk. But my dad was nuclear submarines and he was off and away at sea. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and th these people, you know, my parents, uh, bless their souls, they're all gone now. Mm -hmm. But they, they were just simple folks trying to yeah. get through in the world. They yeah. didn't necessarily know that maybe teaching the kid about thermoglobal nuclear yeah. war at three was not a great <laughs> idea. But I did. I had mm -hmm. a good idea of those things, as most kids had ideas of Santa Claus. Yeah. And so we had a globe at home that uh, just be, you know, Christmas and dad's not home. So mm -hmm. where's, where's daddy? And we'd look at the globe and say, it was probably somewhere over here, mm -hmm. probably. And at a young age, I think, and I've thought about it oftentimes since, but I think that gave me a very three-dimensional view of the world and more as a, as a ball mm -hmm. uh, rather than uh, a local viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And so I was looking at it globally, just trying to say, oh, dad's over here, and this conflict is happening, mm -hmm. the Cold War. And, uh, and he believes uh, future wars are going to be fought over water. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, that wasn't what I would hear as I started to learn what the Cold War is about. So at a very young right. age, I was very interested in what's really going on on this planet. Yeah. And that's where I would say the research began. So also being someone who loved the outdoors, when my father was home, we would go fishing. Uh. And that's where I spent a lot of time in New England, in the Connecticut River, the, the little tributaries, coves, uh, bays, mm -hmm. rivers, and creeks around there. You know, we were regular uh, river rats. Yeah, yeah. Any time we had a chance, we were out experiencing nature, not not just. So we were studying it in a hands-on approach, not mm -hmm. necessarily like a science right. class, but more like an expedition. Right, you right. Know? And so I had this relationship to a very small, delicate world mm -hmm. uh, that uh, I was really, for lack of a better word, just in love with. Mm -hmm. You know, the animals, the fishing, the mm -hmm. being in the creeks, the birds, and I felt like I would get a lot of information. You know, like I could learn, I could deduce a lot of my own problems just by mm -hmm. looking at how animals solve things. Yeah. And I remember one time being really depressed and it just felt like I was facing insurmountable odds. You know, it, mm -hmm. was, it was maybe junior high school, okay. merit, divorce problems, mm -hmm. things like that. And, uh, and I remember just sitting down thinking the answers are always, I was reading, you know, shamanistic Indian, mm -hmm. Indian literature, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. I remember sitting down just watching these ants uh, attacking a, a piece of candy someone mm -hmm. had spit out. And, I, and I, in the course of my half an hour <laughs> <you> know, bleak <laughs> uh, escape, I was watching like, wow, all these ants can actually do an amazing job if each one plays its role. Yeah. And uh, so that way of looking at the world uh, early in terms of the relationship to nature, we have a planet that's kind of in trouble. What's mm -hmm. really going on and what might be our answers? Because mm -hmm. I think for myself, a lot of it was I didn't have a lot of hope mm -hmm. as a kid. So I think finding that was, uh, for lack of a better word, a blessing mm -hmm. and a, a pretty vast expedition mm -hmm. to try and actually get hope. And for me, it came the hard way because I saw more of what the world's problems were rather than what, what, what our possible solutions might mm -hmm. be. So, 
for, for whatever value that's worth. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I would just happy to sit here and listen to you talk. You're, yeah, that's just fascinating <laughs> to me. And I'm trying to figure out where to begin. And I think I have about four different points that I can link together. And the first being, even when you, you know, you starting out saying that, you know, your research process began when you were three, and then you're linking it to, you know, going outside and exploring. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, just hearing how you think and putting those things together, like it's definitely this multi-sensory integration that yeah. you had first starting out and growing up and exploring. Mm -hmm. And then also you then latch on to the fact that, you know, you're, as you said, your dad wasn't around, but you had this representation of the world, mm -hmm. right, as a, in the 3D version. Mm -hmm. And then people, like your dad is somewhere here, but actually the way that you, you referenced that was he was on top of a world somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Floating above the world somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that it was your representation of your dad somewhere, but on a physical structure. Mm -hmm. So you link the fact that you explored the world in a way where it was really hands-on experience, but then you had these other representations mm -hmm. of both your father, but then physical representations of a world that was actually just a representation of something that you're already in and exploring. Mm -hmm. So even at that young age, you had this meta... A meta view. Exactly. It, it, and not necessarily cooked, you know, not yeah. necessarily uh, through any training, just as a default way You're of You're immersed experience. in it. It, yeah. it, just, it just was like, whoa, if this is happening here, then you extrapolate to all the other areas where it's happening. Yeah, totally. And later in life, uh, so, so my first love was fishing. Mm -hmm. And then later in life, my, my first love is still fly fishing. Oh, nice. But that brought a whole other level of depth of understanding to the environment. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, which always inspired the work. And you asked, you know, what's the creative process to mm -hmm. work? So the creative process for me really comes back to a problem to solve. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my own case, maybe this sounds silly as, as I watch blow, <laughs> blow, uh, what are they called? I, I'm watching whales blow uh, yeah. uh, uh, mist up into the air. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. But so it starts with a problem. Yeah. And for me, the problem was ADHD. No, <laughs> <laughs> was, uh, uh, are we going to have a world to live in? Mm -hmm. And it was really that simple. Mm -hmm. And it didn't look like it. Yeah. And as I would listen to the, the, the dialogue, it didn't sound like it. And if I watched the news and the world around us, it, didn't, it mm -hmm. didn't appear to be that way. And so that sent me on the quest uh, first for just survival. How yeah. not to be homeless. Yeah. You know, and how to get by in life. Yeah. And then uh, as I heard someone say, first save yourself, then try to save the world. <laughs> so trying to save myself yeah. first. But then it was, okay... If we can look at this world not in such a fearful way that everything I do every day isn't just driven to put food on the table and pay my mm -hmm. mortgage, but is actually in the pursuit of something greater, mm -hmm. some greater possibility, then for me, that greater possibility was how do we unlock this crash course that we're on? Mm -hmm. And to me, that's uh, eventually, you know, I don't mean to sit here with philosophical yeah, positions and, and politics and stuff. but I'll steer you back to the brain. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. don't worry. But to me, that was... Uh, we have all this tremendous uh, inertia behind failing models. Mm -hmm. One would just be capitalism, mm -hmm. right? So, so we'd say, how do we, you know, I chose not to have kids, yeah. not because I didn't want kids, but because I didn't worry about the kids. I didn't want to worry about kids because I didn't think we'd make it on the planet. Mm -hmm. And so we'd say, well, that's a problem. How might we solve that problem mm -hmm. with whatever tools we as individuals have? And the only tool I felt like I had was really art, was visual arts. Mm -hmm. And so in the beginning, with visual arts, you know, I was drawing and painting guys with axes, and, mm -hmm. you know, like, like the rest of them, yeah. and dragons and Lord yeah. of the Rings type yeah. of stuff. And uh, it was really artists that unlocked my mind, you know, uh, when I started arriving in New York and getting mm -hmm. around serious heavyweight intellectuals, mm -hmm. they'd be like, well, that's, that's really interesting, but where's the beef? You know, right. what's, what's behind this? What's your purpose? Why, right. why? Are you just masturbating and putting something <laughs> up there because it's fun and you go, look what I could do, look yeah. at my talent? Or, or do you see problems with the world that you might use art to address in some way? Mm -hmm. And that possibility really, really woke me up. Mm -hmm. you know, so when I understood Picasso better, for example, you know, and most people don't. Right. They're like... Uh, there's, there's two things happening for whatever this value mm -hmm. is worth. Picasso is in the beginning of the Cubism movement. Mm -hmm. It was not just some spasm of like, oh, art needs to go right. here. It was looking at landscapes of rolling hills in Spain mm -hmm. that were quickly becoming square hills because of factories. Mm -hmm. And the people that used to be outside, like the animals, whether they were ten tilling fields or whatever, mm -hmm. were now becoming gears in a machine inside a box. Mm -hmm. And so we looked at the landscapes becoming cubic. There was much more driving it at a, at a sort of important intellectual observational 
level mm -hmm. than uh, a lot of even what I learned in art history was right. telling me about where that was coming from. And so when I looked at artists like that, I was like, wow, they were able to show us, and this is really in many mm -hmm. ways the art, value of art through mm -hmm. history, show us a way, show us a p possibility. Maybe it's a possibility of a negative part of ourselves that we need yeah. to look at. Maybe it's a possibility of a lighthouse that we should head mm -hmm. towards. But uh, looking at the problem of are we going to have a world, how is consciousness being dictated, mm -hmm. uh, how are populations misinformed, these things became really yeah, intriguing yeah. to me. Yeah. So, you know, propaganda, I mean, my yeah. book collection has a large section on propaganda, yeah. propaganda, misinformation, and uh, population control, yeah. which is not a very well understood science. Yeah. I'm going to interrupt you really yeah. quickly yeah, so I don't forget because I'm thinking of um, several of your what we'd like to call superpowers. Okay? Yeah. So I'm going to try and link a bunch of this stuff together from all the information that you've given me, which again is just to, to, to combine all the fascinating tidbits you've given is amazing. So I think um, one of your superpowers, and as you're talking, I'm like seeing like above your head all these links that you've made. Like you've, you have a very clear way of latching on to, I think at some point, spontaneous thought and then having cognitive control on top of it. And this is actually a feature of divergent thinkers or mm. creative thinkers, and which it has the, they are commonly referred to as divergent thinkers, which is a good thing. Um, but what they, yeah. the skill that they have is that they can actually coordinate uh, co the cognitive control network, regions that are um, composing this cognitive control network, with this network supporting spontaneous thought. And the coordination between the two actually lets you and your brain latch onto a spontaneous thought, link it to another one, link it to another one, and now you're generating this structure mm. of a thought map and also link to mm -hmm. you know, your own memories, your own representations, mm -hmm. that you can then link to these other experiences that you've had as a, as a child. So I think when you were talking about that you had a lack of hope, Mm -hmm. And then you had this, you know, look of their view of the world that you didn't think it was going to survive. Mm -hmm. um, and then you had this experience with, you know, obviously your knowledge of um, painters and, and art is expansive and linking it to the different structures of Picasso's painting um, to, as you're saying, the, the structure of the buildings. You generate, your solution was to generate your own world, right? Mm -hmm. And to generate a hopeful world or one mm -hmm. that could be hopeful mm -hmm. for other people. That's right. Right? And then That's your exactly choice right. to not have kids, mm -hmm. right? In the process, you've given the world another world that kids can actually go in and explore in a safe way. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you're raising, you're mentoring, in a sense, all these other kids that you didn't have to create <laughs> yourself, right? Yeah. But yeah. in a sense, you, you are you have done it and you are presently doing it and you're leaving behind this world that you created because you thought that the the real world was so bleak and helpless <laughs> true that yeah. you wanted to make this you know world that you had a say in and it's interesting because i think there was really uh three predecessors i, I believe there's more but three that resonated mm -hmm. as as beacons for me mm -hmm. and uh, one was the earliest one was walt disney Okay. Uh, who who was creating alternative worlds basically to bring families together. Right. I mean, that, that was a way that I was seeing what he was I actually see. doing, aside from building empire. <laughs> you know. But uh, it was, you know, the, the wonderful world of Disney was something we would look forward to mm -hmm. when it was still in black and white TV. Mm -hmm. I'm dating myself here. Yeah. But, but it was still in black and white TV, and we would look forward to this yeah. you know, every Sunday night. I mean, before VCRs, who can imagine? Yeah. And... Uh, uh, that Disney sort of so would be the early model of someone who created worlds and a brand that actually, you know, we could say were nutritious, nutritious for the family. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we had Henson, mm -hmm. which is where I really learned to read was through uh, Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. And as my partner said later in you know, years, decades later, she said, isn't it amazing, you know, a guy with socks could teach kids how to read. And I was like, socks taught kids how to read. Yeah. This is amazing, yeah. you know. And it taught me how to read yeah. faster than school did. Yeah. You know, I was engaged. And, and so it was always, as a fisherman, mm -hmm. I understood bait and mm -hmm. engagement. Like, if you're going to get something's yeah. attention, you got you to gotta get its attention. Yeah. It has to stand out in the field of what that creature is thriving on. Well, humans are no different. Do you actually realize, and I'm going to stop you right there, because yeah. you used an awesome word, attention. Yeah. Do you actually realize that that's what you're helping? Your, so people who play video games, it's well mm -hmm. known 
that people who play video games have a better attentional system, mm -hmm. more highly tuned and less mm -hmm. distractible attentional system than people who don't. So just the fact that you were even used that to say, you know, to drawing attention yeah. to it, they, you're actually, you know, instilling that in people who are playing your games. That's, that's it, 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 for, for different motives yeah. than, than you just processed it, but I find that kind of fascinating yeah. and, and dead on. Yeah. Uh, in a few different ways, you mm -hmm. know, let's just say one of the things the artist has had to do in the 21st century, really, and the three examples I just gave yeah. are, are the, the materialization of this, is they had to understand economics better. Mm -hmm. They had to understand the playing field better. Mm -hmm. The idea of just cutting off your ear and going yeah, yeah. sobbing in the corner and everyone still being impressed was yeah. over. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, so that means we have to think about market. Mm -hmm. That means we have to think about market share, uh, promotions, uh, PR, right. you know, marketing. And then again, we're back into bait and attention, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's kind of almost most things yeah, in life yeah, for yeah. me come back to fishing. Yeah. It's like if we can't get the attention of them, we won't get any cash. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so when we create property, let's look at a, a later one, Star Wars, mm -hmm. which I think had way more depth on a different level, if you're familiar with Joseph Campbell's Hero mm -hmm. Myth series, mm -hmm. my dad, when he was still alive, he sent that to me. And I was in my second year of college, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, something that was a, a lighthouse beacon for like, wow, I saw George Lucas could make really cool things yeah, fly yeah, around, yeah. you know, samurai monks in space. Yeah. So cool. Look at the designs. So cool. Then, 10 years later, I'm learning, he totally got me. He tricked me yeah. into a world of understanding globalization differently. Like mm -hmm. the subtext on Star Wars was enormous. Right. Uh, at times, you know, heavy handed, at times very subtle. But I realized at that point that I could enjoy it very superficially as an individual, you mm -hmm. know, who just went samurai monks in space. How cool. Yeah. Yeah. To someone going, whoa, there's a message here for better understanding to Yoda's message of we're all connected. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, the force is running through us, whatever that message. Uh, when that happened, that became almost, when I heard Yoda, that really took the place of any previous religious mm -hmm. blanks. There were, it was like that resonated with a different truth to me, hmm. which was really just an old, uh, if you knew where Lucas was coming from, was mm -hmm. really, you know, Shaolin sort of way of looking at life, right. Native American, shamanic, all over the world, the ancient myths, you know, the ancient cultures, particularly indigenous, talked about these things. So it was fascinating. So Lucas became the model for me where I'd say, okay, the problem is we have a world that's sleepwalking. How do we give it what it wants to eat, but offer it new, more nutritious value than what it's currently eating? Mm -hmm. And that was really it. So how do we make a granola covered, a, a uh, a, a carob covered granola bar yeah. look like a Snickers bar. Mm -hmm. But if you eat it, you wind up with better vitamins than had you had the Snickers. Mm -hmm. That's how I perceived media. And that's what I thought Lucas did. Now he eventually became Darth Vader himself. Yeah, yeah. And that's a different story, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, a different conversation. But that's what was really happening. And that's the model that I locked onto. I said, if, if we can, as an artist, you have a burning desire to say something because you see something different in the world. If you can turn that into a package, I used to hear a lot of artists say this, and I think it's total bullshit. They go, mm -hmm. if just one person is affected, you know, my life will have been worth it. It's like, bullshit. <laughs> what do you think you're kidding, man? That's just, if you had the effect, the power to affect in a positive yeah. way millions, why are you so concerned yeah. that maybe you'll get Where one? Where are you from? In New England. New England? Yeah, I grew up What's in Connecticut. Okay. Rotten. Okay. Right yeah, on the yeah. world's largest you know, marine base yeah. for a little while. And okay. then, uh, school, so I'm from New Jersey. In New York. You have, you have My a, parents yeah, are from New Jersey, yeah. both of them. Yeah, yeah Wildwood. Wildwood, yeah. awesome. Wildwood Jersey Shore, yeah. 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 yeah I'm from, my from. parents are in Long Beach Island. Yeah, yeah. there you go. So I, I'm just asking, I'm asking you that because you have the same type of energy that I'm used to, which is like <laughs> Jersey it's an awesome, Shore. Yeah, it's an awesome <laughs> conversation. So yeah. um, I'm also, I have two questions, m more questions, but at least two to kind of um, get some more mm -hmm. clarity on, on your process. First is, in terms of motivation, aside from everything that we've already talked about, about the links that you've made, it seems like you've, you're more motivated from, say, George Lucas, mm -hmm. in terms of what he did and what you wanted to do better, right? Is or, that, is or, that or, inaccurate? Or in a, a different time and a different way for a different audience. Okay, so would you consider that as, were you more, another way to say it is, were you more mentored by what was already done and what you wanted to improve, and it was a self-mentorship or self-motivation um, to improve what was already done um, and also to fill in the blanks as we were talking about to generate your own no, world. It, and it was less about that because I think my process always came more out of desperation rather, desperation. rather than ego. I think ego had a lot of it. Meaning mm -hmm. I hear ego when I hear yeah. to do it better. I see. Right? And that, 
part of that was going on, but the idea of like, do Star Wars better, it never really occurred to me. What more occurred to me was uh, myths are made at points in time to best communicate with the audience of that day. Okay. Right. So, accurate, so, yeah. so this is why a lot of the ancient myths don't hold up for people as relevant anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. So really, this is what sort of Joseph Campbell was begging for at mm -hmm. the end of his life was for the artist to reinterpret the myths, get the purpose of why these might originate in the first mm -hmm. place, reinterpret them from audience that needs to hear it now. Mm -hmm. You know, for for whatever reasons mm -hmm. and whatever the relevant pack, the relevant elements are mm -hmm. now. So it's all different. You know, Star Wars is really a classic. Myth, mythological hero's journey, right? Mm -hmm. The hero's journey, really. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, for me, what I saw was Lucas stopped at a mm -hmm. certain place, and and but the audience was still going. Mm -hmm. And so, we're we're talking about a guy who grew up with television and probably still watches the news at night. Right. Right. Now, I don't know. I'm projecting. But mm -hmm. I say that because it was so entrenched in his youth getting old. But his new audience is not watching television. Mm -hmm. Right. So maybe mom and dad are taking you there. But if you are now an Internet child, mm -hmm. you're growing up with a different stream of knowledge than the one that was more prepackaged mm -hmm. from you from a limited number of networks and, out and press outlets, you know, that may yeah. have had, had your mind share. But today's mind share is in a different place. It's much more scattered. Mm -hmm. And it's in a, uh, I mean, we're still talking about one of the most successful yeah. brands of all time. But uh, the, we've learned a lot since those were created in the 70s. Uh -huh. And with what we're learning today, I thought, huh, we, a couple of things. One, and I proposed this to my partner before we started a video game mm -hmm. company, is I said, consider this. Next year in the United States, this is 1992, mm -hmm. as I did the math, 60 billion hours of human mind share would be going into video games. Wow. So there's a market there, mm -hmm. but what's it getting, right? As I saw it, and as my partner saw it, who had no interest in video games, yeah. uh, I was saying, look, this, this is an opportunity mm -hmm. because uh, what is the message that's really being drilled home in that model that exists yeah. that's getting 60 billion hours? At that time, it was largely aggression equals rewards. Mm -hmm. right? Kind of it. Yeah. And we said, well, what, what really do we need more today almost than anything? Empathy, maybe? Mm -hmm. And so how do we maybe adjust the paradigm of video games where 60 billion hours are going to be spent next year than uh, in Mindshare? Mm -hmm. uh, how do we adjust that maybe to empathy equals rewards? Mm -hmm. And that became a paradigm that I was able to convince at least my partner to, to take the journey you know, mm -hmm. and start a game company that I came from the film business. So yeah. the film people were like, what are you thinking? <laughs> you know, today they're like, how visionary. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're looking back and yeah. everything changed. Uh, but I was looking at it like we have this problem. We have this appetite of humanity. Uh, most of it's uh, under a, 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 a mass hypnosis, yeah. quite frankly. Yeah. And, uh, and that's just heading us right for the cliff. Mm -hmm. And then if we love this world, like really the people and the creatures and everything, yeah. you know, might, might we do better than just surviving ourselves? So, so would it surprise you if I then told you that um, in people who have excessive empathy and compassion, actually that network is the same as the reward system and the link that you made between reward and empathy actually exists in the brain and the substructure that supports the reward system it, is the same neural structure that also is linked to empathy and compassion. So you already, you know, totally, whether you knew this or not, that's actually... It totally actually, surprises me. Yeah, it's the and, same. And, and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. but, I'll, but maybe this is, this is like, I, it surprises me in that way that you're so glad to hear validated, even though you've yeah, never yeah. heard it put that way yeah. before. But the reason is, is because why would that be? Why would it be that the empathy connection is connected to the reward connection in a human being who's healthy? Yeah. And, and I ask you that because I don't know. Okay. Well, yeah. it's from that perspective, think about um, the reward itself, right? Your, your brain is trying to give you a good feeling right? Dopamine hit, right? Mm -hmm. um, from getting that reward, whether it's getting money, whatever your motivation is, getting money. If you're from an evolutionary uh, perspective, um, going around eating a palatable food, so you know you're going to go back to that as an energy source. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you have sex, you're going to have the same uh, reward circuitry firing that dopamine. Mm -hmm. Then in this case, giving back 
the compassion, the empathy, having that altruistic perspective actually also is a dopamine. It's a preservation of the clan. You just had this whole so tangent. Was, yeah. So what we're saying is it, it was, if I, if I yeah. can add, what you're saying is it was basically it evolved out of a series of wins right exactly that, are, that have proved to sustain humanity better exactly so you were having yeah. that same interest and that same link to have that win but you were you were paradigm shifting right yeah. you're were, you, were, you were shifting the entire field you were changing how you know exactly what you said there was a market for it but your yeah. motivation was not only just from a market perspective but an improvement to to change right and fill fill a hole so yeah. i wasn't trying to say to link it back to you know comparing you to George Lucas or mm -hmm. ego, mm -hmm. and I wasn't saying that at all. The links that I was making was, you had, you said Yoda. When you said Yoda, I had an image of Yoda. Mm -hmm. Everyone in the room had an image of Yoda, mm -hmm. right? When you say Darth Vader, same thing. Mm -hmm. When you say uh, Big Bird, you know what Big Bird looks like. Mm -hmm. But you you have you have done that with the characters you've created and the worlds you've created. People now who play your game. They see and I don't, I mean, I was reading the different character names, right? Sure. A lot of them, like, I, th I was seeing them for the first time. You're generating, by doing that, even aside from people learning the, sti mm -hmm. the statistical regularities of the world you've created, just the expertise of learning the, the alien or the, the form that you created, the, the being you created, mm -hmm. to that name, that actually changes the circuitry in the brain. You're giving people a new expertise, specifically in the visual system, and in structures that actually are nearby and are involved in face perception. So what you, if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're saying is in, by having the unique naming structures, mm -hmm. which is often driven by trademark ability, <laughs> 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 copyright, yeah. uh, but for both purposes. A, uh, they're usually anagrams. Okay. And then uh, uh, trademark purposes, yeah. as, as you know, someone yeah. doing business in the world today, creating intellectual property. But uh, that's... Interesting. So what you're saying is, if I'm I'm given a new idea, I'm get, as an audience, I'm yeah. given a new idea, I'm given a uh, face, and I'm given a name. All these are forcing me to wrap my head around something new that Some, isn't necessarily in my repertoire. Exactly, yeah. but it's the expertise aspect. So I could learn it on day one, mm -hmm. and you could give me a test on it, and maybe I would get you know 90% of them right. But that's not going to change the whole structure. The expertise over time. So the longer you're you know, your users are playing your game, mm -hmm. the more that expertise is actually changing their structure. So think of um, car X, you, you drive motorcycles. Mm -hmm. I'm sure if I, if I showed you different types of motorcycles, different mm -hmm. models, you would know the names, everything, years, everything else. I wouldn't. You have a mm -hmm. different expertise for that link, mm -hmm. that visual perception that I don't have. Mm -hmm. Birders also, people who are bird experts. There's, they have that, the name, mm -hmm. the structure, the link, all the details, really detail oriented. That's the, that expertise changes the organization of particularly the fusiform gyrus. So your fusiform, I'm guessing, is different than my fusiform. It's underneath your ear, mm -hmm. and it's actually one of the structures that I stare at all the time. It's underneath your ear, down the temporal lobe, um, and it's a ventral part of the brain, and it's involved in you know, coding visual categories in particular, and faces are one of those visual categories. So it's ter termed high-level vision. So all the characters you're creating, your users are actually engaging and changing potentially as they use your game longer, the fusiform gyrus in particular. Particular anatomical structure consisting of six different layers as we mm -hmm. were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. and the firing of those neurons are actually changing as your players play your game longer and get better. And linking it back to empathy and reward, now because they are also rewarded by the experience of your game and also, you know, navigating through the world mm -hmm. more accurately than they were more efficiently the longer mm -hmm. they play it, they're getting that dopamine hit. They're getting that, you know, reward aspect to it. So I think in your generation of the game and your creation of the game and all of that information, your one of your superpowers and another one of your superpowers is that I think you're your visual perception, your creation of those characters, and the, em the empathy you might have for either the characters or the, your users that are gonna mm -hmm. play the game mm -hmm. is really just so heightened compared to mine. I mean, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't generate, you know, I don't build worlds. Mm -hmm. you know, I study the brain, I have mm -hmm. conversations with amazing people. It's I don't build worlds. It's interesting because, um, you know, like now my, my brain's just running on, on uh, if I understood that better earlier. Uh, because it really w was kind of driving in mind is that uh, it's kind of a saturation faith. Mm -hmm. If if 
if whatever we saturate ourselves in, if someone's going to plug into a video game experience for 20, 40 hours, mm -hmm. um, then maybe you have the opportunity if it's, if it's taking a general, mm -hmm. it was like a, a percentage of improvement, mm -hmm. <laughs> of mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, if, yeah. it's, if it's physical diet, it's vitamins and mm -hmm. nutrients, if it's media diet, it's kind of the same thing. We don't measure it mm -hmm. necessarily that way. Like where's, what's true junk food of media? What's, what's truly nutritious? And uh, so m m my faith, and I think my partner's too, was more that if you could create experiences that saturated people mm -hmm. more in, you know, uh, uh, types of content that basically were, had the intention and the craftsmanship of, mm -hmm. of being better, f richer for mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Then, then you would benefit from that. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But you're you're turning that into a science, mm -hmm. right? And I, 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 was, I was really, to. I was really coming at it through a faith. Yeah, really. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that's kind of true. They don't necessarily have to be independent. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, and that's what I felt was one of the world's biggest problems: is that we didn't have faith, not faith in religion, but faith, faith that it was going to work out. You know, back mm -hmm. to hope. Yeah, and the, the really interesting part is, in addition to that, and hope, and everything that you're describing, and linked to faith. You're, you're trained as an artist. And as we had mentioned before, yeah, there's a new field or starting out called mm -hmm. neuroaesthetics, mm -hmm. which is basically how the brain pre views and appreciates art. One of the pioneers in that field was actually one of the grandfathers of my field in visual neuroscience and visual perception. And he's made the claim that neuroaesthetics or how we appreciate art is actually based off the same laws and principles as how the brain just performs simple visual processes. So based off of your experience of, and you're, mm -hmm. if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, um, a photorealistic mm -hmm. painter, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that is trying to capture, you right. know, everything as accurately as possible. Right. And that is also based off of what the visual system does. Right. It tries to accurately depict the world as best it can and fills in the blanks even when it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And so based off of those basic laws and principles of the visual system, you're also then applying it to the game that you're creating because, and, and that art mm -hmm. and that process. Because again, another one of your superpowers also, I think, is you have all these amazing links and experience and then you take something that could be as uncontrolled as generating your own world, but it's principled. There's so many principles. You're saying, mm -hmm. you know, you're a fly fisherman, you're relating mm -hmm. it to bait. Everything is principled, it mm -hmm. has a reason, there's a structure to it, and that structure that you're generated not only is based off of your own faith, but it's your own perception and experience and your um, you know, background in visual art that is also linked to the processes of your own brain processing your visual world by you attending to those certain features and certain links that you've put together. I think, that, I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that's correct. And I think that uh, uh, it's, it's fascinating to me to sort of wonder why, mm -hmm. you know, as individuals, like, 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 are we being driven because we had a unique experience and we're just a derivative of, of a Darwinian uh, accident in one direction or another that may have a better chance to survive or not, mm -hmm. right, based on these things? Or, are we, or, or is there something else throwing, flowing through us that, and this is kind of in the realm of science, it's kind of a difficult conversation today, but really, is there something else flowing through us that we're not measuring yet that gives us these ten tendencies that when we try to embrace them, we actually, are rewarded mm -hmm. through this evolutionary biological system that we're living in and mm -hmm. on. You know, and when I think of all of the, and what you're saying, like number one is, is so we'd say attraction, attention. Mm -hmm. Can mm -hmm. we get their attention? And then I think a big component of that, which I'm really curious to your take on, is awe. Mm -hmm. Really awe. The value of awe. You know, so uh, depending on the time of day, we would all probably pause if the awe out the window was just incredible. Right. The sunset, right? Right. And yet, uh, and I'm curious through our abilities of how we're measuring that today, because I always come at it as a, uh, and one, as an artist, as a photorealist, you're deconstructing what you see and you're trying to get past what you think you see and actually deduce what is there, mm -hmm. right? And this is uh, the critical element. Yeah. It, it, because your brain is filling in even when you don't want it to. Mm -hmm. And all your preconceived notions or right. whatever your, your right. attentions and focuses are. But that process of deconstructing to see, I think carries over beyond just visual yeah. and it carries over into analyzing life. Yeah. Like you go, okay, I think I see what I see, but that's yeah. not really what I see. But behold, 
most of the people around me think they see that, but yeah. that's not what's really there. Yeah. Right. And then the, the uh, so that's one aspect of like seeing through that maybe you see to something that they would, the majority would have benefit of mm -hmm. uh, if you were able to reinterpret that and put that out there. But to cut through, it seems to require awe. Mm -hmm. And this is something where I look at like uh, filmmaking is really, mm -hmm. you know, if we think to Fritz Lang or you know, even Disney, mm -hmm. right? seeing Cinderella. I mean, the people, audiences were just, I mean, they were yeah. just taken by it. Yeah. And there's something, uh, and from what I understand, you know, neuroscience is beginning to uh, have more weight in the value of awe. If, mm -hmm. I'm, if I'm correct. Yeah, I think there's, uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can, we can apply awe mm -hmm. to what's, you know, the terms that are used in neuroscience and also just basic principles of, the brain, of brain organization that I think are also involved in the exact concepts that you're describing. So as we were talking about earlier too, the brain looks for patterns and statistical mm -hmm. regularities. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that you, I'm assuming, generate awe in your... Um, audience is not only, and what Disney uses and, and Hollywood uses, is not only the visual pleasure of what you're looking at and the, the fact that it might be on a grandiose scale that you don't mm -hmm. expect, mm -hmm. but it would be that it's unexpected. Mm -hmm. And that's what neuroscientists mm -hmm. call prediction error. Mm -hmm. The brain is expecting one thing and then you, you throw it a curveball, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it changes their model of what's mm -hmm. expected. Whether it's mm -hmm. the scale of something or as you described, mm -hmm. you saw the water shoot out mm -hmm. from the whale, right? Mm -hmm. And so you weren't expecting that. You see it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you didn't expect it, but now it's incorporated into your model of this general situation. So now if you saw that again, it's expected. Your brain's incorporated it and you're, you're gonna ignore it. So the other aspect right, right. is you attended to what was unexpected, but now that your brain was exposed to that possibility, you're, it's not unexpected anymore and you can ignore it and you can go, you can, figure out you know, your way through the noise of whatever it, you're looking at. The, the element to it, right, the, the bait, mm -hmm. is that uh, is how, do we, how do we create characters that cut through our prejudices? Yeah. So uh, this, to me, became a design problem. Like, very few of us, and it probably has to be something wrong with you, to go up to something we know is innocent yeah. and harm it like a puppy, right. right, or judge it, right? So as things mature, as people, we all love ba babies, mm -hmm. but as they grow up, we love them less, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it really, right? But because we kind of acknowledge an innocence that we all acknowledge. We, mm -hmm. we hear this in war all the time, you know, guys, they go through all this, they do all this stuff, but then they're confronted with some innocent moment yeah. and they couldn't, and, yeah. they, and they, they find a, a, a cap in their own abilities yeah. or when empathy takes over. Yeah. Um, so to me, in designing characters specifically, uh, oh, what I was going to say is what you just described yeah. is screenwriting. Mm -hmm. I see. That is screenwriting. What you just described about how the unexpected is necessary, mm -hmm. that's what gr great screenwriters do. Mm -hmm. Except the, the last time they did it, now they've got to figure out a new way to do it because you know it. Yeah, exactly. And that is screenwriting. Exactly. Really. Exactly. Like if you study with the best screenwriters, they're all, this is what it's all about. Yeah. Because that audience looked at it this weekend and now next weekend they're going, that was great. But that's what What's the new? brain does. It's not just the audience. That's right. what I'm saying. Whether, right. whether screenwriters know it or not, or whether you're, you know it when you're developing a game, you're actually using those elements and it's because it's, your, it's based off of your experience in your world mm -hmm. and now we're, we're running out of time but and i mm -hmm. want to ask you one last question sure. which is you've had an incredible you've navigated your your life you know you, you you've generated your own path so if you had to actually advise you know kids at home people at home that are trying to navigate their own path or maybe they're trying to figure out you know should they take that risk based off of your rather unconventional or seemingly unconventional way of looking at the world yeah what would your, what, how would you advise people trying to make what that What I decision? would advise is what I wish I had done. Okay. Which is, which is uh, in, in the scheme of things, fear can keep us alive, right? Mm -hmm. If you're getting chased by a wild animal, <laughs> it can keep you alive. Yeah. Uh, we live in a modern world where so many of the decisions we make are driven by fear. So many of mine were driven by fear. And then at different times, you know, they had spotlights of inspiration. But, uh, so fear has its place and it has its value. But don't let it drive your... You, the limitations of what you think you can do. And I think even in my life, I did a lot of that. Mm -hmm. I, I've had, I don't know what would have happened had so many of my, uh, so many of my ambitions not been capped with rational fears. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd say, 
pursue, find the inspiration, find the light mm -hmm. that when you, when you taste it, whether it's music or art or writing or science or an investigation into any area, when you taste it and you go, ah, it lights your passion, follow that. And if you follow it with, with intensity and with uh, gravitation, that you, just, you, know, you wake up and whatever its focus is, follow that and let fear be a guiding force, mm -hmm. but don't let fear guide you know, those decisions. And I don't know where I'd be today if I'd done that. I'm sure it's in an even better place, but I'm really grateful for where I am. But if they can find that spark that gives them a light beacon and pursue it without fear and just pursue it with excellence and just the desire to be great at your craft, whatever that is, uh, I, think, I think that's the winning chemistry. Well, I'm glad your path led, it, led you here into this conversation with you and your brain. And I'd just like to say that uh, thanks for spending the time with us. And you've heard it here. Don't be controlled by fear. And uh, just remember the brain you have is not the brain that you're stuck with.